and welcome all of, all of you to the second of the series of webinars titled Frontiers in Chemistry organized by Section E2 of the Sri Lanka Association for the Advancement, Advancement of Science. Uh, this morning, it's my privilege to introduce the speaker, Professor Tamara Hendrickson. Uh, so without further ado, let me introduce the speaker to the audience. Uh, Professor Hendrickson received a bachelor's degree from the prestigious Wellesley College in 1990. Uh, later, she completed her, completed her PhD from the California Institute of Technology, uh, and she has served two postdoctoral post fellowships at the National Institute of Health, one at the MIT or Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and later at the Scripps Research Institute from 1997 to 2000. And she has also worked as a tenured professor at the prestigious Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore, USA. And she's currently working as an associate professor at the Wayne State University in Michigan, USA. Professor Hendrickson's lab is investigating the indirect biosynthesis of glin tRNA glin and SN tRNA SN in pathogenic bacteria such as Helicobacter pylori. Her lab is interested in understanding the evolution of direct versus indirect tRNA amino acylation pathways, as well as the mechanisms that are used by Helicobacter pylori to prevent the misacylated tRNAs from entering the ribosome prior to conversion to their accurately amino acylated counterparts. Her pioneering work has led to many publications in reputed science journals, including the journal Science itself. She has been the recipient of a couple of uh, notable awards, including the American Cancer Society Research Scholar Award in 2007, and also the Research Corporation Innovation Awards Award in year 2000. And uh, also from very re reliable sources, I have got to know that Professor Hendrickson is an expert in authentic Sri Lankan cuisine, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, <laughs> so without further ado, it's my great honor to introduce, uh, invite the speaker, Professor Tamara Hendrickson, to take over the stage. So uh, let me welcome you in the traditional Sri Lankan way, Professor Tamara, I Bowen. Thank you very much for being here with us. I know it, it's past midnight for you, Madam, but we really appreciate uh, taking you uh, that you to have taken your time to be here with us today. So without further ado, let me uh, hand over the controls to you. Please take over and you may proceed better. Thank you so much for the invitation and the nice um, welcome. I wouldn't say, I, I would say I'm an expert at eating Sri Lankan cuisine, um, not necessarily at making Sri Lankan cuisine. Although I have, um, uh, I will say that I now make kotu for my family every Christmas, my extended family, as well as on Christmas morning, we now have egg hoppers. Um, I've been, Really fortunate to have some excellent um, Sri Lankan students work in my lab um, and also some excellent cooks and they've been willing to share um, their <clears throat> their family recipes with me. So um, there's a few things that I know how to make. I really do hope that at um, sometime in the you know foreseeable future, I get to actually visit Sri Lanka in person rather than just speaking to you all virtually. I can see that the molecular biology class is filing in. I will share my screen and dive right into the material. Some of the material that I'm gonna talk about today is I'll, I'll talk about a little bit of work that um, Dr. Gayathri, Gayathri Silva did when she was in my lab um, as well. I do wanna encourage uh, people to interrupt with questions if it gets a little confusing <clears throat> Excuse me, I have a touch of a cough. And um, so if it gets a little bit confused, confusing, it's a little, the field I work in has a lot of jargon. And so I will, um, I'll try to go slow and I've put in the slides at certain points, bullet lists of things that are really important to remember um, that I hope will address some of the jargon. So I'm gonna tell you about Gayathri's work that led to the discovery of a new enzyme that promotes a process called indirect tRNA amino isolation. And then I'll tell you about what we've done with this enzyme since Gayathri graduated as well, because it's proved to be a really interesting um, protein. <clears throat> I don't know how diverse your um, backgrounds are. I don't know if everybody here has some biochemistry background. So I wanna start with um, some very basic biochemistry just for a couple slides to make sure everybody's on the same page or same foundation. I am a protein enzymologist. So I'm interested in um, enzymes and how they catalyze chemical reactions. 
And just to be sure that everybody's aware, what enzymes are, are polypeptides. So they're chains of amino acids. You can think of them as beads on a string. Um, each one of these beads represents a different amino acid and they're connected by um, amide bonds. And in this primary sequence of amino acids is the information needed for the protein to fold into its three-dimensional structure and also for it to then function as a catalyst. Um, within, as we're thinking about um, how proteins are made in biochemistry, many of you have probably, most of you have probably heard of the central dogma, wherein we have DNA that encodes all of our genes for proteins and RNA. Um, our systems, our cells read our DNA and transcribe them into different RNAs. And then these RNAs are translated into the proteins that make up enzymes. Now, my lab is interested in a specific kind of RNA called transfer RNAs and the amino acids that are put on the ends. These amino acyl tRNAs are critical intermediates in the process of translation, where the messenger RNAs are read and transcribed into proteins. <clears throat> and I just said that. Um, and so this, it's the, pro my lab is most interested in the process by which these amino acids are put onto the end of the tRNAs. Each tRNA typically, um, particularly in us as humans, as well as in the bacteria and some bacteria like E. coli, are directly amino acylated. And so here the amino acid is shown as a circle. Um, the tRNA, has this L shape. And then here are these enzymes called the amino acyl tRNA synthetases. So in E. coli, there are 20 of these enzymes and each enzyme is specific for one amino acid and one set of tRNAs. And then it uses ATP to activate the amino acid and to transfer it onto the end of the tRNA. So here we produce our amino acylated tRNA. Um, and then this amino acylated tRNA is taken up into the ribosome for protein biosynthesis. So these amino acyl tRNA synthetases are the last step prior to the ribosome that can accurately put each amino acid onto each tRNA. And so it's really here, it's just shown in color that it's really important that the red amino acid is core, uh, attached to the red tRNA. So these enzymes are usually highly specific <clears throat> in um, that they, sp they really pick their own or cognate amino acid and tRNA and match them together. Even though there's a large pool of tRNAs as well as amino acids for them to pick and select from. <clears throat> and so as I mentioned, um, in E. coli and in humans, there are 20 amino acids typically. And so there are 20 amino acyl tRNA synthetases. The problem is, that rule doesn't hold true across the wide array of um, bacteria and other organisms that exist on earth. And so um, it turns out that many bacteria as well as archaea, so many microbes have fewer than 20 amino acyl tRNA synthetases. And what you'll see is that they, on purpose, they make a mistake in, tr in tRNA amino isolation. And what we know is that if we make too many mistakes in the amino isolation of tRNA, especially in microorganisms, that quickly becomes lethal. In humans, we have a lot of mechanisms that can compensate for that, for mistakes like this. But um, even in humans, it can lead to diseases as well as lethality. So, so far, what you should be taking away from what I've said is that these amino isolated tRNAs are critical intermediates in protein translation or biosynthesis. They're made typically or directly by the enzymes called the amino acyl tRNA synthetases. However, many bacteria and archaea, so many microorganisms, are missing one or more of these tRNA synthetases. So they break this rule of 20 amino acids requiring 20 amino acyl tRNA synthetases. My lab is interested in how do these organisms that break this rule survive and make a complete set of amino acyl tRNAs. So the two tRNA synthetases that are the least common are the glutaminal tRNA synthetase, which we abbreviate GLIN-RS, and the asparaginal tRNA synthetase, which we abbreviate ASIN-RS. So GLIN-RS normally makes GLIN-TRNA-GLIN, 
Um, and it's abundant in eukaryotes, okay? Um, but once you move into bacteria and archaeal genomes, only about 10% of bacteria have a gene that codes for a functional glinaras. And there's not a single example of an archaeon that has a glinaras. Asparaginal tyrannase synthetase is more abundant. Uh, like glinaras, 100% of eukaryotes have an ASNRS gene. And about half of bacteria have ASNRS, and about a third of archaea have ASNRS. Nevertheless, despite the fact that these so-called essential enzymes are missing, these organisms still make the products glin tyrannae glin and acin tyrannae acin so that they can incorporate glin and acin into proteins. Um, I'm gonna to talk to you today predominantly about two pathogens, um, but I think it's always worth a, a minute to step back and say, why is this important? I personally think this system is important, is just interesting and is therefore important, but it's also important biomedically because so many bacteria that are missing one or both of these enzymes are also human pathogens, okay? And so some examples here, um, Borrelia burgdorferi, which is the, um, tick-borne disease that causes Lyme's disease. I don't know if you have Lyme's disease in um, Sri Lanka or not. C. jejuni, if you've ever gotten food poisoning from chicken, uh, it was probably that you got a Campylobacter jejuni infection. My mom actually got a very bad C. jejuni infection late last year from cleaning out her bird feeders. Um, Mycobacterium tuberculosis, this is the bacterium that causes tuberculosis. Staph aureus, including methicillin resistant Staph aureus. So this is the bacterium that causes a lot of blood infections as well as skin infections. Helicobacter pylori causes stomach ulcers and stomach cancer. Um, C. difficile causes um, gastrointestinal um, food poisoning kind of conditions, but it also, it's often acquired in the hospital and can be fatal. Um, Streptococcus pyogenes causes strep throat, rickettsia proezeki causes typhus, and then Neisseria gonorrhea, which, uh, gonorrhoi, which causes gonorrhea. Um, my, I, this should, nice area should no longer be in black. Um, I'm going to talk to you predominantly today about Staph aureus and H. pylori. Here's a picture of Helicobacter pylori. It's itself is an interesting bacterium in that um, it colonizes our stomachs. Uh, I don't know the statistics for Sri Lanka, but in the United States, about one out of every three Americans has H. pylori. It's an infection that's acquired um, in childhood. And um, Pylori survives our stomach, but it's acid tolerant, not acidophilic. So it survives by producing a lot of urea uh, and spitting urea out of its cells to buffer against our um, stomach acid. Uh, Pylori is the causative bacterium behind most stomach ulcers and I believe all stomach cancer. And from the purposes of my work, Pylori is important uh, because it was the first bacterial genome that was sequenced that was missing the genes for both of these tRNA synthetases. And I like this picture um, because it's these are orange and green or sort of this sort of gold and green are the Wayne State colors. So I did not color this picture. I found it on the internet, but it was very kind of them to color it uh, with the Wayne State colors. So I want to briefly tell you how indirect amino isolation occurs. So these are the processes that organisms use to circumvent the fact that they don't have either GlinRS or AsNRS um, in their genomes and don't produce those proteins. So to make glin tRNA glin, Helicobacter pylori has an enzyme called GluRS2. Uh, this enzyme recognizes tyrannin glin, but it misacylates it with glutamate. So it produces glu tyrannin glin, an event that would be lethal to the bacterium if that was the last step. And so instead, Plori has another enzyme called GATCAB. GATCAB recognizes this misacylated tyranny and fixes it converting it to glin, tyrannin, and glin. It does this using ATP and another molecule of glutamine, and it's fixing the side chain of glutamate. So the side chain of glutamate is a carboxylic acid, the side chain of glutamine is a carboxyamid. Um, ATP is used to activate that acid, and then glutamine is used as an ammonia donor to convert glue to glin. Now, importantly, note here that this is a two ATP process. 
direct amino acylation, if we had GlinRS, would be a one ATP process. So this is one of the questions that this field is starting to understand why bacteria would maintain this energy consuming process instead of being like E. coli that has figured out how to do it in one step. Now, a very similar process is used to make acin, TNA acin. In this case, um, H. pylori has an enzyme that we call a non-discriminating asparase. We call it non-discriminating because it still puts asp onto TNA asp. So it does its normal reaction. Gluras 2 does not. So Gluras 2 has lost the ability to put glutamate onto tyranate glue. So ND asparas makes asp tyranate acin. And then the same GAT CAB recognizes this misacylated tyranate and repairs it, converting that asp to acin to make acin tyranate acin. So combined, these two processes make the two amino isolated tRNAs that they're supposed to make. And my lab has been interested, I've now worked on this system for 22 years, and we've tackled the system from a lot of different directions. Uh, we discovered GluRS2 almost 20 years ago. We've studied a lot of the enzymology of GATCAB. Um, I'm interested in the evolution of this entire system. And what I'm going to tell you about today are our, our are our efforts, that's hard to say, um, to understand how glue tyranny glin and asp tyranny acin are sequestered away from the ribosome. So these organisms 100% of the time misacylate two essential tyrannies, and yet their accuracy in protein translation is the same as, for example, E. coli, or very similar to E. coli, when E. coli never misacylates these two tyrannies. And so my, in say the past 10 years, this has been one of the bigger questions in my lab for how can we understand what prevents these two misacylated tRNAs from entering the ribosome and causing not just errors, but potentially lethal errors. Um, I think I just said this, I meant to take this slide out. Um, so we'll just move on. So I feel like my changes didn't get saved here when I manipulated this a little bit today. So we came up with three hypotheses, okay? Um, and so the first, and, and then it turns out that each of these hypotheses is true um, and contribute in different ways. So our first hypothesis was that the enzyme called elongation factor TU would be involved. So EFTU is the enzyme that normally loads, it's hard to see here, but there's an amino acid on the end of this tRNA. So EFTU loads amino acylated tRNAs directly onto the ribosome. And so one hypothesis that we had was that EFT would discriminate against these amino acylated tRNAs, these misacylated tRNAs, and prevent them, so imagine an X here on this arrow, prevent them from entering the ribosome. So to look at this question, we looked at how efficiently do each um, amino isolated tRNA, how efficiently does each amino isolated tRNA bind to EFTO? So I'm showing you some of these da our data down here on the bottom. And this, I'm going through this fairly fast. We published this years ago. So um, here you can see these are binding curves. So first look at this top curve here. This is ASP tRNA ASP binding to EFTU. And if you take the halfway point here and you come down to the x-axis, we have a KD of about 40 nanomolar, okay? But then when you look down here at asp tRNA acin, and it's drawn here as a slash with asp because of the way we express our tRNAs and purify them, we had slight levels of contamination of tRNA asp. But you can see now that we see essentially no binding. And if you tried to take the halfway point and calculate a KD, at best, this KD is near a millimolar, near a micromolar. Um, and that micromolar KD is probably due to the contaminations of ASP, uh, tRNA ASP in the system. Now, this experiment was run using the EFTU from Helicobacter pylori. We ran the same experiment with the EFTU from E. coli, and we see the same result. That is, in some ways, remarkable, because remember, E. coli is never going to see ASP, tRNA ASP. It does it has acin RS, and so this misacylated intermediate is never 
um, presented to EFTU. And nevertheless, the EFTU from E. coli has retained this discrimination ability. Now, it gets a little more complicated when we switch to looking at glutyrinate glue versus glutyrinate glin, partly because H. pylori has two different tRNA glue isoacceptors. So if you look at this first one with the squares, again, we see perfect binding and we see a low nanomolar, maybe about 100 nanomolar um, KD. And when we look at glue tRNA glin, we effectively see no binding. Now, what happens a little bit unusually with glue tRNA glue one um, is that we see Normally in a binding assay, you should see binding go up to a um, fraction bound of one. We see a fraction bound of around 50%, 40%. Um, it has a KD of around 100 nanomolar, but we don't know why it's not fully bond, um, binding. Um, the suggestions are, the hypotheses are that maybe uh, we make our tRNAs in E. coli. So even though this is an H. pylori tRNA, maybe it's lacking a modification that it would get in H. pylori, but doesn't get in E. coli. Uh, another possibility is that it, um, that tRNA glue one is used for something outside of translation. And so it is meant to not bind to EFTU. Now, when we use the E. coli EFTU, we see the same pattern. We don't see binding with glue tRNA glin. We do see binding with glue tRNA glue two. Um, and we do see binding with glue tRNA glue one, but we don't see complete binding. So all of this tells us that EF2 limits asp tRNA acin and glue tRNA glin access to the ribosome, as we had hypothesized. Now, another explanation is that the enzymes involved could form a complex, okay? And um, this complex was uh, discovered or characterized by uh, a lab for the first time, this complex from Thermos Thermophilus was characterized, characterized or discovered by a lab in France. And what they showed was that GATCAB and ASPRS form a mega complex that's held together by tRNA. So just to remind you, ASPRS and GATCAB are the two enzymes that are um, essential to make acin tRNA acin in the absence of acin RS. We're getting into that jargon now. So here you can see we have this complex and hopefully you can see my hands. Imagine this is the, um, this is the tRNA. Okay, it can bind to ASPRS and then rotate into the GATCAB active site. So in this way, the amino acylated tRNA is never released from this transaminosome complex until it's correctly amino isolated. Um, so the first structure was discovered in T. thermophilus. Later, a lab in Canada discovered, um, characterized the same complex or very similar complex from Pierre Genosa. At the same time, my lab in collaboration with the French lab that discovered this transaminosome was trying to characterize this transaminosome complex from Helicobacter pylori. And so, and it turns out we couldn't. We couldn't get a complex to stably form until Gayathri joined my lab and started characterizing this protein that was annotated as a, of unknown function. And she discovered that HPL100 drives the assembly of an acin transaminosome from H. pylori. And one of the things that separates this transaminosome from the other two, is you can see, I know there's a lot going on in this figure, but there's no tRNA required. So the acin transaminosome from pylori assembles fine without tRNA bound versus the two from these two other organisms where tRNA binding is absolutely essential. So that gets us to two, and I'm gonna tell you about H. pylori. Um, throughout this talk. So that gets us to our third hypothesis. And that is that other players exist to protect translational fidelity. And so the question is, how do you identify these new participants? And I've already given away the ending that H. pylori is gonna be our new, um, HPO100 is our new protein participant. So I'm gonna spend the rest of the time today telling you how we discovered HPO100, how we get the data that shows that it drives this transaminosome together, and then how fascinating this enzyme has become because it turns out it's doing a lot of different things. So to, in order to identify a 
protein of unknown function that might drive a transaminosome or promote indirect TNA amino isolation in another way. We turn to um, an analysis that was published more than 20 years ago now um, by a, a company in France where they mapped all the possible protein-protein interactions in Helicobacter pylori. And um, they did it using a yeast two hybrid system. And that by the strength of the responses that they saw, they provided maps like the one shown here where you could search for your gene of interest. So I searched for GATA, which is one of the subunits of GATCAB. <clears throat> and you get a map that looks like this. And you can see everywhere where there's a line is where they saw a symbol. Uh, they saw a protein-protein interaction in vivo in yeast. And they gave all of the, their responses if, essentially a letter grade. So if you see a red line, like you see here with GAT A and GAT C, that means that all of their data suggests this is a biologically important interaction. And that makes sense because GAT A and GAT C are two of the subunits of GAT CAB. So we already knew these interacted. And then you can see the, as the grades get weaker, so does the strength of their data. And so if you look here, we really only see into proteins interacting with GAT A with D and E level interactions. And frankly, D and E level interactions are noise. There isn't any reason to believe that these would be biologically significant. So here you can see is that HPO100 protein. So it was with just these data, Picking HPO100 would have been a very random um, per pursuit. And, but when you step away from these data and then you look at the proteins that interact with HPO100, it gets much more interesting. So here's GAT A, and now I've added HPO100 into the search and said, okay, here are the interactions with GAT A, what interacts with HPO100? And so obviously there's our D interaction with um, HP100 and GAT A, but then look at this. Here is a B level interaction with ASPARAS. So now we have HP100 um, connecting the misacylating tRNA synthetase with the repair enzyme. And this was enough for me to be curious. And thankfully, as I had this hypothesis, Gayathri moved to Wayne State and wanted to join my lab. And she was brave enough to take on this very risky project, okay? Um, and at the time, this was a while ago, at the time I pitched it to her and I told her it was very risky. Um, and we had a plan that if it didn't work out, we would do something else and um, to make sure that she graduated. But it turned out that her entire thesis became about HPO 100. So um, what Gayathri did, I feel like there's a slide missing here. Oh, here, I skipped over it, thank you. So I'm gonna, Gayathri's paper was published 11, nine years ago. And so I'm gonna go over just some highlights because I wanna have time to talk about what we've done since then. So these are really highlights that represent a ton of work um, done by um, Gayathri as a graduate student. So what I'm showing you here in the upper left is a native gel. It's one of many in this publication of hers. And the key lanes are these two last lanes. So in native, native gels offer a way to look at protein complexes if you're lucky, because sometimes protein complexes will dissociate in the gels. Sometimes you won't get clear resolution of bands. But what you can see here is here is, uh, sorry, I meant to correct this. ADT is GATCAB. Um, so here is GATCAB alone. Here we've taken GATCAB and we've added tRNA asparagine. You don't see any upward shift indicating a larger complex forming. When we add GATCAB and HP100, however, you do see that upward shift indicating that HP100 does bind to GATCAB. Um, and then when we add Asperus, we get an even higher shift, indicating that all three of these proteins, GATCAB, Asperus, and HPO100, are assembling into a transaminosome-like complex. And then here, really importantly, is this last lane. So here we've added ADT and Asperus. We haven't added HPO100, but we've added, oops, sorry. We've added tRNA asparagine. Now you can see we've lost that upward shift again. So this is what shows us that we're not making an 
pranzimidazole, like was seen in other organisms. Um, and so then I also used a technique called dynamic light scattering. So these two techniques are really orthogonal and complementary to each other. So in DLS, the advantage of DLS is that you're in solution. Um, and so it's much more like um, the conditions that would be seen inside a cell. The disadvantage is um, some, your, your um, complex has to form 100%. And dynamic light scattering is assuming your complex is a perfect sphere. So anything deviating from a perfect sphere, which is most of nature, um, is going to give you results that are more error prone or less quantifiable. Nevertheless, you got really useful information. So here is the DLS response for just ASPARS, which we know is a dimer. When she adds HPO100, the diameter of ASPARS increases, telling us that HPO100 and ASPARS make a complex. Okay, that we had not seen um, in this gel that I've shown you over here on the left. Now here is the GATCAB alone DLS. Here's GATCAB plus HPO100. We see only a little tiny increase that's not statistically significant. Um, GATCAB is a huge enzyme and HPO100 is a little small enzyme. Um, so it wasn't dramatic enough to see a shift. But when we add all three components together, we now see a much larger shift, larger than um, the HPO100 GATCAB complex or the ASPARS. HPO100 complex consistent with this transaminosome assembly. Um, unfortunately, we could only do um, we could only estimate stoichiometry for ASPARS and ASPARS plus HPO100. As the complex got bigger, the error got bigger, um, and our particle is apparently deviating from sphere, um, and so it got much harder to do any predictions about stoichiometry. So now we have clear evidence of an acid transaminosome assembling. The next step was to say, does that impact activity for either ASPARS or GATCAB? We saw no impact, and when I say we, I mean GAIA3. We saw no impact on um, ND ASPARS activity, so I'm not going to show you that data, but I'm going to show you the data. Hmm. My buttons are getting tight or something. I'm going to show you the data for GATCAB activity. Okay. So, what Gayathri did was she used a series of TLC um, plate assays. So, it, this assay is quite complicated, doesn't really matter how it works. What matters is that if you see AMP in the TLC, that was a deacylated tRNA. When you see ASP AMP, that was ASP tRNA acin, our starting material. And then when you see acin AMP, that tells us that GATCAB converted ASP tRNA acin to acin tRNA acin. And here you can see that conversion occurs in the absence of HPO100. But I think it's easy to see visually here that as soon as we add HPO100, these spots are significantly darker than these spots, showing us that HPO100 was enhancing the rate of this reaction. You can quantify these spots. These are radioactive spots. This is 30, uh, P32 in the AMP. So we can quantify these spots. And here you can see a plot. Here's the rate in the absence of HPO100. Here's the rate in the presence of HPO100. And again, this is looking at GATCAB converting ASP tRNA acin into acin tRNA acin. So from quantifying these two slopes and comparing them, we can conclude that HPO100 induces a 35-fold increase in the KCAT of GATCAB with ASP tRNA acin as a substrate. So that was the first evidence that we had that HPO100 was participating more than just assembling that transaminosome complex. That allowed us to propose a cycle um, for this transaminosome. And so what we proposed, um, and I shouldn't say proposed because there's a lot of evidence that this is the cycle. Um, and so basically HPO100 drives the assembly of ND ASPARS and GATCAB into an APO transaminosome. This transaminosome can then recruit tRNA asparagine to make the hollow transaminosome. That hollow transaminosome then takes aspartic acid 
amino acylates the TRNA asparagine. Next, a glutamine is used to convert that ASP TRNA acin into acin TRNA acin, which dissociates, freeing the transaminosome for the next step in catalysis. So an important question here, um, and I should mention, so that's the end of this publication of Gaiathri's. An important question that Guy, one of the things that Gayathri answered before she graduated was what about the conversion of glutyrnaglin to glintyrnaglin? Um, so glutyrnaglin to glintyrnaglin is not going to use aspirates, but is HPO100 going to impact the kinetics of that reaction? And in fact, it does, but not as dramatically. So here, using the same um, TLC assay, um, Gayathri was able to show that adding HPO100 to GATCAB causes about a fourfold increase in the conversion of glue tyrannic glin into glin tyrannic glin. Now, this was impressive because we couldn't isolate a glin transaminate zone. We tried all kinds of things. Our collaborators in France tried all kinds of things. No one has been able to isolate a glin transaminate zone that appears to be functionally relevant. So how is that happening? So to begin to tackle how is HPO100 doing all of this, we constructed a model um, using David Baker's software at the University of Washington in Seattle um, on the Rebetta website. And what the Baker Lab um, approach does is it looks for three-dimensional crystal structures of proteins that have similar um, secondary structures. And um, for HPO100, it built a model off of arginosuccinate synthetase. And that was interesting because arginosuccinate synthetase has an AANH domain, which hydrolyzes ATP to ADP. And so we looked at the sequence of HPO100 and all of these residues shown in red are consistent with that AANH domain. So that allowed us to hypothesize, does HPO100 bind ATP and does it hydrolyze? So to look at this, we adapted a very common um, ATPase assay. It's an enzyme coupled assay that uses, um, that looks at the conversion of NADH to NAD plus spectrophotometrically. So, um, and it's a coupled assay, so this conversion corresponds to the hydrolysis of ATP to ADP. Now here you can see some important controls within this coupled enzyme assay. If you add ATP or AMP, you don't see any change in absorbance. So adding ATP or AMP does not lead to the conversion of NADH to NAD+. However, when we look at HPO100 and we add ATP, if we add ASP tRNA acin, the misacylated tRNA, um, we see hydrolysis, sorry, we see conversion of NADH to NAD+, which corresponds to hydrolysis of ATP to ADP. Interestingly, that rate is much slower um, what if the tRNA is in the presence of the amino acid, but they're not covalently attached to each other. And here you can see that we just confirmed by TLC that we were producing ADP, not AMP um, instead. So this tells us that HPO100 hydrolyzes ATP to ADP specifically in the presence of ASP tRNA acid. So, um, we went on and calculated and quantified this um, to a much greater degree. And here you can see that HPO100 alone in the absence of tRNA has a low, low rate of ATP hydrolysis. When we add tRNA acin, doesn't change. When we add tRNA acin plus ASP, it doesn't change. But as soon as we add ASP tRNA acin, we see about a threefold increase in um, rate of ATP hydrolysis. Yep, yeah, go ahead. Is that a question? No? Okay, just a mistake. And then as soon as we add ASPRS, that rate doubles again. Uh, and so this is important because remember ASPRS and HPO100 form a complex. 
Okay, so this is the first direct involvement of ASPRS we've seen in HPO100 activity. So we ran these same experiments using tyranine glutamine, and we see a similar trend in that adding glue tyranine glin increases the rate of ATP hydrolysis. However, in this case, when we add GluRS2, we don't see much of a change. And that is probably because GluRS2 and HPO100 don't interact in a complex. So the next thing we did, and when I say we, I should have Gayathri's name on here because this is still all Gayathri's work. Um, the next thing we did was we went into our model and we said, where would this ATP bind? And um, this was using where the ATP is bound in that arginosuccinate synthetase complex. And Gayathri made some mutations at key residues in HPO100. So what we hypothesized was that mutating each of these residues, ASP10 and Tyre32, to alanine would disrupt ATP binding and then would con consequently disrupt ATP hydrolysis. And she saw something very unusual. So very unexpected and unusual. So when she made these two mutations to alanine, you can see here, this is the glue tyranine glin dependent ATP hydrolysis, and it went back down to that basal level. However, the asp tyranine acin dependent ATP hydrolysis didn't. It went down to about half. Now that's unexpected because if you've disrupted ATP binding, you should have disrupted ATP binding. That should be the end. And um, and so. How can we explain this divergence that our mutations only impacted ATP hydrolysis with glutarin and glin? Gayathri went back to the drawing board and looked at the HPO100 sequence again, and she discovered a second signature sequence called a P loop. P loops also bind ATP and can catalyze the hydrolysis of ATP to ADP. Um, and here you can see where the P loop is in HPO100. So it is distinct from our AANH domain. And so she ran the same experiment. She said, what if I mutate residues in that P-loop domain to alanine, what will happen? And amazingly, she saw exactly the opposite scenario. So when she mutates in the P-loop domain, we lose asp tyrone acin dependent ATP hydrolysis, but the glu tyrone glin hydrolysis drops to about 50% again. So to summarize what I've told you so far, um, H. pylori, um, HPO100 drives the assembly of an acin transimidazome in the absence of tyranny. This complex is now faster at the transamidation of asp tyranny acin to acin tyranny acin by about 35 fold and of glue tyranny glin to glin tyranny glin by three to four fold. And we know that um, it has a P-loop domain that hydrolyzes ATP to ADP in the presence of asp tyranine acin, and an AANH domain that hydrolyzes ATP to ADP in the presence of glue tyranine glin. We hypothesize that this ATP hydrolysis is driving this um, rate acceleration um, in both cases. But to date, we don't have solid data to indicate that. So at about this time, we all got frustrated with purifying H HPO100. So HPO100 proved to be very hard to reproducibly purify and work with. So we switched to looking at the Staph aureus enzyme. The Staph aureus enzyme is much better behaved in the lab. Um, and it, has, it still has the AANH domain and the P-loop. And uh, Literally, as she was about to uh, graduate, Gayathri started to say, you know, there's some conserved cysteines in the sequence. Maybe it binds metals. So I'm going to now show you, she had very preliminary data with HPO100 um, showing that it bound metals. I'm going to show you some data for um, S. aureus. We collaborated with the Stemler group at Wayne State. They are iron binding protein experts. And we used an assay that they had developed um, that's an iron competition assay. So basically they developed this compound called MAGFURA2. MAGFURA2 binds iron um, with a KD in the low micromolar. Um, and importantly, it has a different lambda max when it's bound to iron compared to when it's free of iron. 
And so what you can do is set up experiments where you titrate in your protein of interest with iron and Megthera, and you monitor the absorbance at 325 and 366. And then with some math, you can use this to um, calculate KD values if your protein binds to iron. So we did this. This is now work of Brianne Lewis in the Stemmer lab in collaboration with another student from my lab, uh, Whitney Wood. And what you can see here, here's SA2591 alone. Not really that important, except for to show you that it doesn't interfere with what we're measuring. You can see that as we titrate in iron, we're seeing a growth of the iron complex as we're seeing a decrease in the concentration of the APO complex. Um, I should mention all of these experiments were conducted under anaerobic conditions because we didn't know the oxidation state that would be needed to bind iron. So Bree and Whitney, uh, well actually Bree in this case did all the math. So we did a, a series of um, assays with different ratios of iron to SA2591 to Magthera, um, and then fit these data to different ratios of iron binding to SA2591. The best data fit that came out told us that there would be two irons binding and that they both have low micromolar KD values. Um, Brie also took our HPO100 sample to um, the National Accelerator in California so that she could do X-ray absorption spectroscopy. Um, we got some nice data there. Now here is the, she just did it with two different samples. So both samples look the same. The important part here is actually this little shoulder right here. Okay, this is the pre-edge peak area. And from the shape of that shoulder, we can conclude um, that our irons are binding in a symmetric six coordinate system. And then from the excess data, we can conclude that our, and our irons have predominantly oxygen nitrogen. So at that point, we were trying to figure out what was going on, and we thought we should do a new model of HPO100. So we loaded HPO100 um, into the ITASR program because it had been about 10 years since our previous model, and structure prediction models had gotten much better. And interestingly, the new model was modeled off of um, 2-thiouridine synthetase. 2-thiou has an iron sulfur cluster in it. So here are these cysteines that Gayathri found. 2-thiou also binds ATP right next to this iron sulfur cluster. So we have some contradictions here because our XF data suggests that we should have a iron bound to oxygen. We should have two irons bound to oxygen. But our crystal structure predictions, our model, suggests we should have an iron sulfur cluster. Now, how we, we've never purified SA2591 under anaerobic conditions. So our hypothesis is that if there was an iron sulfur cluster, we lost it during purification. OK, I can't explain for sure yet why we see the oxygen nitrogen Xaps. Um, so the question comes up, there are really two questions. Does SA2591 bind more than just this iron, the irons in this iron sulfur cluster? And then why would it need an iron sulfur cluster? So the probable answer was actually published by uh, a friend of mine, Valerie de Crecy Lagarde. Um, she and I were postdocs together. She's a microbiologist that's interested in tRNA modification. She hypothesized that HPO100 and SA2591 were actually involved in cuisine biosynthesis. The way she did this, so here's cuisine. Cuisine is a funny modification of guanosine. It's not a mistake that there's not a nitrogen there. In E. coli, this enzyme called QG catalyzes the last step in cuisine biosynthesis. So it converts this epoxide to this alkene. Um, but there are lots of bacteria that make cuisine but lack QG, including if you dig through here, somewhere in here is Helicobacter pylori and Staph aureus. Maybe they're not actually in this file. Oh, there's Staph aureus. So Staph aureus has both QG and this Duff 208. So Valerie hypothesized from doing a lot of comparative genomics that this DUF 208, which stands for Domain of Unknown Function, would replace QG 
in organisms like if you look here, Haemophila somnus that has DUF208 but doesn't have QG. Um, and so she set up an in vivo experiment to test that hypothesis where they took the, e it, so this is in E. coli, they took E. coli QG and they knocked it out. So here, these are HPLC traces, and here you can see is the trace for epoxy cuisine on the left and the product cuisine in wild type E. coli. When they knock out the QG gene, now they only have epoxy cuisine and no cuisine. But when they take that knockout and they add in SA2591, our protein, they see restoration and now they're making cuisine again. And same thing down here, adding in HPO100, they see the restoration of cuisine biosynthesis. So these data say that HPO100 and SA2591 complement this Delta QG strain in making cuisine. So Valerie beat us to the punch and renamed these proteins QH. And it's a long, it's, well, it doesn't matter. It's a complicated story why she didn't know about our work with um, HPO100. And so we thought then, so the challenge with Valerie's data is that this was all done in vivo. So there's always a little tiny bit of doubt with these kinds of complementation assays that you might be missing something, um, that you're not seeing exactly what's going on. So we tried, and when I say we, I mean Whitney, um, to reconstitute cuisine biosynthesis in vitro. And, um, and it didn't work, unfortunately. So basically here we're looking for we took tRNA, were we able to make cuisine? And so here you can see, this is LCMS. Here's where you see the data for cuisine. Here's epoxy cuisine. So if we had, and then here are our experiments. So if we were successful in making cuisine, we should have peaks here. And you can see we don't. And I suspect that's that we're not reconstituting that iron sulfur cluster effectively yet. So we are proposing a mechanism for the synthesis of cuisine based on everything that's known. Um, basically, we're proposing that HP100, SA2591, all these QH orthologs have a sulfur. That sulfur could be in the iron sulfur cluster. It could be a different sulfur in the protein that would open up the epoxide, activating the emerging alcohol with AMP. Um, then we would have another sulfur. Again, it could be in the iron sulfur cluster or it could be another sulfur on the protein that would make a disulfide with this first sulfur to make, allow the alkene formation with AMP uh, leaving. I want to say this is purely speculative right now based on you know, general enzymology principles rather than actual experiments. So where that leaves us is... Um, that HPO100 is really complicated. We now think it has an iron sulfur cluster. We know it hydrolyzes ATP. It accelerates GATCAB. And but we have as many unresolved questions as we have resolved questions. I think experimentally, an important question is: can we resolve that iron sulfur cluster? Um, and then if we do, does it enable this conversion of epoxy cuisine to cuisine? Or are there other features, maybe even another protein involved? Um, and then a bigger picture question is how does one fairly small protein do all of these things that I'm showing you on this slide? Um, and then one of the things I didn't mention is that this cuisine modification is found in tRNA asparagine. So is QH reading tRNA asparagine for cuisine, to know that it should be putting cuisine in there. So I wanna end with one last slide. Valerie, just at the end of last year, published a crystal structure of QH from the thermophile Thermatoga maritima. And indeed it does have an iron sulfur cluster as we had predicted. It also has another iron consistent with both Gayathri and Whitney's data. In T. maritima, that iron has cysteine ligands. However, T. maritima is a, um, a thermophile. It's, I have not done enough analysis yet with this structure to decide if I think our um, SA2591 would have oxygen ligands here instead of the cysteine sulfur ligands shown there.
So the most important slide is to thank all the people involved. I tried to thank them as I've gone along. These are all the people that have been in my lab and have graduated with their PhDs or were postdocs in my lab. Um, the data I showed you today was predominantly with, from Gayathri Silva and Whitney Wood, um, although Udumbra Ratnayaki, who is also Sri Lankan, as I'm sure you all just guessed from her name, um, was also involved in um, a lot of the efforts to develop better purification methods for HPO100, um, as well as some of the SA2591 data. Um, here are our collaborators. I should have Valerie de Crecy Lagar's name on here as well. These are the agencies that have funded these programs. I am happy to take questions. And again, I wanna thank you so much for the invitation to speak to you all tonight. Um, I wish you all the nicest day. I'm gonna to go to bed soon. All right, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much, Professor Tamra. It was indeed a very delightful presentation. Things were very, Thank very you. clear to us. Uh, I'm sure you are ready, ready for bed, Madam. But if you oh ready. no, no, I'm fine. <laughs> I'm uh, fine. So let's quickly move on to the Q and A session. So I would like to remind you that you may now unmute yourself and ask any questions if you have, or instead you may also type in your questions in the chat box, and we will present the questions to the speaker. So we are ready for the questions. So are there I also want to add to, I'm happy to take questions about Wayne State, if anybody's interested in moving to the US. I'm sure there will be a lot of questions for you, madam. <laughs> okay, we are ready for questions. Uh, if you do have questions, like I said, please unmute and ask questions, or else you may also raise your hand or even post your question in the chat option. I'm sure the students who are here today will have a lot of questions about Wayne State. <laughs> I have some pictures, I think. It was very nice to see the number of Sri Lankan students that you have mentored. <laughs> so Yeah, so, so four, Sandamali, yes. Delani, Udumbra, and Gayathri. So may I know where they are right now, Chris Tamra? Yeah, so Sanda Mali is, um, she is our chemical hygiene officer for Wayne State in our Office of Environmental Health and Safety. And we are actually about to submit a paper. She graduated eight or nine years ago and we're about to submit a paper from her. Delani just last week took a new job. She lives in Cincinnati, Ohio. And she's now, um, we're, I don't know much details because it's so new, but she's working for a company that synthesizes DNA oligonucleotides. Udumbra is a postdoc at NIH in Washington, DC. And obviously you all know Gayathri. Um, okay. She's a lecturer at the University of Colombo. Yes. And Dr. Gayatri is the one who connected you with us. So thank you, Dr. Gayatri, for doing that. Uh, you're welcome. It's a great pleasure to have you, Tamara, here. I mean, it's oh, so it's nice so to... fun. I wish I was there in person. So there's a question in the chat from Delani on how did we decide on which a amino acids to mutate in the P loop? So let me go back. That's an excellent question. So the key, oops, I went back to, no, I didn't. Here we go. So the key thing, there are two key things. One is that this ATP is very crude on, in this structure because we're using the ATP from the arginosuccinate synthetase structure and just docking it crudely onto our HPO100 structure. And But what we did was we looked at the conserved residues. Um, and the residues that are known to be involved in um, ATP hydrolysis and arginosuccinate synthetase. So we were trying to pick conserved residues that looked like they were near where this ATP would bind. But it was, in the US, we'd call this a crapshoot. It was a gamble. Um, so we were actually really lucky at how well these residues, I expected at the time that we would have had to make um, multiple mutations. Um, we really didn't, they worked out right away. And then the P-loop was much easier um, because P-loops are much better characterized and they're shorter. Um, and so the P-loop, it's, it's very clear what residues are likely to be involved. And so we just contained those. Okay, Professor Tamara, thank you very much. That does make sense. Uh, does that answer your question, Dilani? Do we have anything else to add? Yes, it did. Thank you. Thank you, Dilani. Are there any other questions? Yeah, I can ask one. So, Tamara, yeah, why do you think that uh, HPORI and some organisms rely on HPO100 uh, for the stable assembly of transamidasome, while some organisms can still make a stable transamidasome in the absence of HPO100? 
That's an excellent question. I have no idea. <laughs> How's that? Um, I have a feeling it will come down to cuisine synthesis, actually. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I honestly don't know. So that would be my hypothesis, but I don't want to speculate more than that because it would become deep speculation. Any other questions from students? Uh, they used to have a lot of questions for you. I <laughs> must be a little nervous too. It's very comp It's a complicated system. There's Dr. a picture of Wayne State. Yes, Dr. Gatri, I think that's a question from the audience. Uh, ah, okay. Uh, is it Targuni? Tar 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 May I ask a question? Yes. Please go ahead, Targuni. Yes. Uh, uh, beautiful presentation um, talk, uh, Prof. Tamir. It was very, very nice, very uh, enlightening. Um, I wanted to ask a question on this um, this work. Is there any um, relevance towards drug discovery in this? I mean, uh, these these uh, principles that we you, you nicely presented. Is there anything uh, that we can use in drug discovery against these uh, pathogens? So in multiple ways, yes. Um, although I don't do that work. Let me get back to the here, let's go here. So these transaminosome complexes are really unique to these pathogens, okay? So any, you know, there's a lot of, it's very hard to do, but people try to make drugs that disrupt protein-protein interactions. And so one possibility is that we could disrupt protein-protein interactions and have that be a therapeutic. Um, another would be to just inhibit GATCAB alone. Okay, and now with our discovery of HP100, I think HP100 start, is starting to look like a valid target um, for the development of therapeutics. Okay, thank you very much. It's sort of up in the air whether HP100 is essential or not. You know, because the there have been a few reports of looking for essential genes in organisms and that HPO 100 isn't essential, but I tend to think I'm not a fan of the tests of just knock out a gene and see if the organism lives, because that's not the same as seeing if it can live in its host. So I think the jury's still out on whether HPO 100 is an essential gene or not, but I think disrupting these complexes is very much a valid target. Thank you. Thank you for your kind words too. Thank you, Professor Tamra. Are there any other questions? And thank you, Tarabini, for your question. Doesn't look like there are many any other questions in the chat option. Uh, Professor Tamra, I'm sure there are many students uh, with us this morning waiting to join postgraduate job opportunities probably in USA. So, I mean, uh, what is your experience based on your experience? Can you tell, suggest anything for our students, how in terms of how they should add, uh, apply for universities and how they could make their research of interest? Oh, that's such a good question. The challenges of getting into an American institution, right? Um, so obviously for Wayne State, we have a large Sri Lankan population in our graduate program. Um, and so uh, that's one piece of advice, not just to encourage you to apply to Wayne State, but anytime you can apply to a school where somebody from Sri Lanka has already gone there, that's an advantage. Um, not only would it be easier for you to move if there's already a Sri Lankan community or even just a single Sri Lankan student, right, um, that can help you adapt, um, but it also suggests that that department is aware of um, how grades and transcripts are um, in Sri Lanka because, of course, the Sri Lankan transcripts versus a typical American transcript from college, they're very different. Um, and so our department is really used to interpreting Sri Lankan grad, um, transcripts and sort of interpreting them so that we know what to look for in students. So I would say the things that can really make you stand out are a strong personal statement. Um, and so in your personal statement, be really specific about um, what your interests are, what you think you want your career to be. Um, if there are specific faculty in the department you'd be interested in working with, um, state that, that these, but don't just state one, state the three or four probably faculty whose research is interesting to you. Um, now in the era of Zoom, um, you may be interviewed. Uh, a lot of American universities are gonna look for strong TOEFL scores uh, because you'll have to teach in English. That is just not a problem for Sri Lankan students, of course, uh, because all of your, because your university is in English. And um, 
I think that's it. A little bit of research experience goes a long ways. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Pamela. I'm sure that's that information will definitely be very, very helpful for our students uh, because most of the people in the audience today are undergraduates who are actually hoping to graduate over the course of this year or the next. So they will definitely be looking forward to apply to Wayne State as well as many other universities in USA. So mm -hmm. thank you very much for sharing your insights on that regard, man. And Thama Rahansi, I hope I'm pronouncing your name right, um, has a question in the chat about this too. So um, the chemistry department and the Wayne State Med School are on the same campus, but it is a huge campus. So I would say that the med school labs, like Tim Stemler is in our pharmaceutical sciences department at the med school. I would say it's, it's probably three kilometers, two and a half between the chemistry department and Tim's lab in that it's about a 25 minute walk. So about two kilometers probably. So yes, they're on the same campus, but they're not in the same building. They're pretty far apart. Thank you again, Professor Tamara. Are there any other questions? Students, please ask questions. You had a lot <laughs> of questions <laughs> related um, to higher studies. Yeah. This is Tanindani again. Probably I'll ask this question. I just missed a little bit of your talk. Um, but but I saw that there was a uh, uh, energy, a high, high, uh, the use of two ATPs in the, in the, in the correction of this mistake adding um, an amino acid to the um, the, the, the tRNA so mm -hmm. how you managed to figure out why why there is a higher energy consumption and what, what's the purpose of this so that's an excellent question and so I would say that there's so this is the original pathway so it's the ancestral pathway and the more efficient pathway is the newer pathway so the question is really why do these bacteria keep? this high energy pathway when they could be more efficient like E. coli. So I think there's a couple of possible explanations and they probably both play a role. Um, one is that um, H. pylori, the tRNAs it has, it would require a lot of mutations in the tRNAs for H. pylori or Staph aureus to be able to take the GlinRS from E. coli through a horizontal gene transfer. So it's hard. It's not something that could happen spontaneously easily. So I think that's one, one explanation. Another is that there's some beautiful work coming out of this professor um, named Babak Javid, who just moved. He's funny. He's, I think he's Iranian, but grew up in England. But then he started his career in China, and he just moved to the U.S., to UC San Francisco. So he's been all over the world. And, um, but he works on tuberculosis and he has shown that tuberculosis can co-opt this indirect tRNA amino isolation pathway to combat antibiotic challenges. So a sort of a form of antibiotic resistance. And so, and then there's some data coming, not related to this system specifically, but there's some data coming out of the University of Chicago that shows that bacteria want to be able to be sloppy sometimes. And so if we go way back to the beginning, do, 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 we're almost there, here. So this question of how do we prevent these from entering the ribosome, there is now some evidence that organisms want to have the flexibility to make mistakes when they're stressed. And so another possibility is that these two misacylated tRNAs are actually used by the ribosome to combat different kinds of stress. Um, and so that would then give them a selective advantage to have the flexibility that would come from this system. So I tend to favor that explanation, that having these misacylated tRNAs offers stress, survivability, flexibility that we just don't understand yet. That's a great question. Okay, thank you so much. Any other questions? Any other questions from the audience? Okay, so I believe uh, that's all the questions that we have. Uh, the time for Professor Hendrickson is almost two in the morning. <laughs> so we will not <laughs> keep you any longer, madam. So let me now invite Dr. Gayatri Silva, who coordinated this event today, to propose the word of thanks. Over to you, Dr. Gayatri. Thank you.
So hello everyone, we are at the end of today's webinar on discovery and characterization of multifunctional enzyme that promotes tRNA aminoacylation. I hope I'm audible. Hello. Yes, we can hear ah, you. Okay. So and on behalf of SLAZI2 2022 team, I would like to thank Professor Tamara Hendrickson from the Department of Chemistry, Wayne State University for conducting such a wonderful and informative webinar. I'm truly blessed and grateful to have my own PhD advisor here with us today, educating us on how bacteria have adopted divergent mechanisms to synthesize protein. And it was so refreshing to hear about the new HPO 100 related work uh, carried out after I left the lab. It was quite uh, intriguing. And thanks again for honoring us with your presence. And SLAS E2 team, wish you all the very best for your future. And we are looking forward to work with you to organize many more exciting and educational activities in this year. And as you have mentioned, hope to see you in person uh, next time. And I'm also thankful to the students, academics, and researchers for your participation, response, and cooperation to this event. Thank you for such productive discussions. And thank you very much for joining with us. And uh, over to you, Lahiru, to talk about our next activities. And uh, Tamara, thank you so much for taking your valuable time uh, and joining us uh, in the middle of the night. Uh, thank you very much for everything. I really appreciate the invitation. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Gayatri. So with that, we have come to the end of uh, the webinar today. So let me once again thank our speaker, Professor Tamara Hendrickson, Hendrickson for being with us here. Uh, so thank you very much again, Madam, for your valuable presence. It uh, was really delighted to hear the excellent cutting edge research that is being conducted by you. So thank you very much for your presence. And before we leave, before we wind up the session, I would like to remind you about our upcoming events, Section E2, as well as the Sri Lanka Association for the Advancement of Science. We are organizing a lot of uh, webinars and other activities of this nature. So please join with us if you are interested. So the two upcoming up activities that we have is one webinar tomorrow, that's Wednesday, the 16th March, which is uh, titled Cancer Stem Cells. Catch me if you can, as you can see on screen. So that will be held tomorrow. That's once again uh, conducted through Zoom. And we have another webinar coming up next week on the 23rd March, next Wednesday. So the, uh, the flyers of these two events are already published on the SLAS website. So if you are interested, please uh, check the SLAS website and join us in these activities. So thank you very much, everyone, for being with us this morning. Uh, we wish all, the, all of you the very best in whatever you plan with your future. So thank you very much and have a very pleasant day. We will see you again in our future activities. Thank you.